The metering device is a throttle. It's a restriction. It meters the amount of refrigerant going into the evaporator. Okay? The evaporator is another heat exchanger. It's the point where it picks up the heat from whatever the product or the air or whatever we're trying to get, remove the heat from. From the evaporator, it goes into the suction line. The <coughs> suction line connects the evaporator back to the compressor. That's where we start. Back to the compressor. It's a cycle. So the components are the compressor, discharge line, condenser, liquid line, meter and device, evaporator, and suction line. Six. Okay? How many did you get? Six. Hopefully so. Did I miss one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now let's get a little more detail about it. I'm going to use not exact pressures or temperatures and describe what's happening within here. And then we'll go back and we'll actually do one using some typical pressures and temperatures, okay? But for right now, let's look at the compressor. The compressor takes a low pressure gas, compresses it to a high pressure gas, enters into the discharge line is a, you remember this term, superheated high pressure gas. Remember that term superheated? It's above the boiling point. <coughs> Goes into the discharge line and enters into the condenser. The condenser de-superheats the gas. Once that sensible heat is removed, it then goes through a latent heat process. You remember what latent heat does? change of state. It starts condensing. That's where it gets its name condenser as the heat's removed from the refrigerant. Starts condensing, turns into a liquid. When it's all liquid, it then subcools the liquid in the last pass or two. What subcool? Sensible heat below the saturation or boiling point, right? Okay. Enters into the liquid line. It's a high pressure liquid. The, temp the, the, the pressure has not really changed that much other than the loss through the piping itself. So basically the high side pressure is going to be the same at the discharge as it would be at the liquid line. The only difference is here we have gas, here we have liquid. The heat's been removed. Enters the metering device. The metering device throttles the refrigerant, or, or it's a restriction in the line. If I needed a simple definition of a metering device, <clears throat> it's a restrictor. Okay? All right. It throttles the refrigerant that enters into the evaporator. We're entering the low side from the metering device. This comes in as a saturated state usually of somewhere in the neighborhood 35 to 40 percent of the refrigerant boils off or, or changes state and cools the remaining liquid as it enters into the evaporator it will continue to pick up the heat from the from the uh, air or <coughs> product we're trying to cool and we go through that latent heat process notice there is no subcooling in the evaporator here in the condenser we had subcooling. We don't have subcooling in the evaporator. Anyway, it will continue to boil, pick up that heat through the latent heat process until it is all gas. It's under low pressure. It's all gas. We use a last pass or two to ensure that we have superheat. That's above the boiling point, right? Low pressure gas enters the suction line, returns to the compressor as a superheated low pressure gas. All right. What do we do? That sounded pretty technical, but what did we really do? <clears throat> we picked up heat from over here, and we put it over here. Most of the work was done through the latent heat process. Y'all remember that number that I showed you? The big number of BTUs that could be removed or added by the latent heat process? That's where this takes place. Yes. And is that only work in one direction? 
Okay. Yes, this is on the, the gas always or the refrigerant always moves in the same direction. Always? Always. Okay. Yes. What the purpose of the quarter? What for to be coiled up like that? What's that now? Like you said the lines are coiled up. Yeah. What's the purpose of that? Okay. In order to be able to get enough surface area, you you, you have to have the coils, if you will. And in order to be able to get the components small enough to have enough surface area to remove or, or, or uh, some, uh, soak up that heat, if you will, depending on which, whether it's evaporator or condenser. Okay. And in all honesty, you may not have coils like that. Sometimes you have plates. It depends upon the uh, design of the system itself. Okay. And that's a good, good question because condensers and evaporators comes in all different shapes and sizes. That's, that's another subject in itself. Though. Yeah, they'll get into that in 1020, 1020. the components. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said that the uh, compressors and vapor pump, they don't like liquid. Okay. A little bit about superheat. We had superheat coming in and we had superheat leaving. In both cases, that's vapor. I like to compare things to automobiles, and uh, I kind of figure we understand automobile pretty good. I mean, that's part of life. And inside this compressor, you have oil and you have refrigerant. It's supposed to pump the refrigerant. The oil does its job of lubricating, keeping things from seizing up. If I have liquid refrigerant come into this compressor, it dilutes the oil. Okay, what's that mean? It's like this. If I had already gone and, and, and paid for my gas and I couldn't quite squeeze all of it into the tank, I know that never happens anymore at the cost of gas, but for some reason or another I actually filled it up and they said they weren't going to give me my change back, but I didn't want to go away without getting everything I bought. So I had another 50 cents left of gas, so I just raised the hood and put it in the engine. Would the engine still run? It would. But what did I do? I diluted the oil. More than likely over a period of time I'm going to run the engine, right? Well, that's what liquid coming back into the compressor does, is it dilutes the oil. Okay. It also cools the motor in the compressor. The returning gas cools the motor in the compressor. So either, in either case, if the superheat is too high, you're not going to get the proper cooling. If it's too low, you may actually wash out the bearings. That's another lesson, but I think it's worth mentioning during this, this uh, part. Okay.